you're to a woman to be cut up and um, but you you can live I look this happened to me six years ago I've worked ever since I've been here on a tour in America I've been working in London I've done movies I mean it doesn't stop you from living mm -hmm. and also I must admit one thing uh, when you come to my age and you know how old I am uh, it is naturally not as difficult as it is for a younger woman I'll be honest with you, I don't know how old you are, and I... It's I, in the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't... Uh, I, um, I feel badly that I used the word old. It sounded so... <laughs> I meant in the familiar sense, as in a person... Uh, we should be able to use old without it being a chronological term, and I know I sound like very defensive, and I am, and you have my apology. I didn't mean to suggest that. No, uh, I don't mind that at all. I mean, you really don't, do you? No, I don't at all. And I think that it's foolish to hang on to youth all the time. I mean, we certainly, are, we have had youth, we've had middle age, and we're trying awfully hard, you know, to see if, if we can make it a couple more years. And then uh, you suddenly face yourself in the mirror and you say, well, I look like I did yesterday. You don't see much of a difference in the mirror. Then you see a photograph, or what is worse, you see yourself on the screen or on the television screen. Yes. And, <laughs> and you, you say, say that well, isn't me. I don't look like that, do I? I'm not that old. Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> We're in Chicago with Ingrid Bergman, and we'll be back in just a moment. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, you're beautiful, and you've stayed so slim. Uh, uh, what is your diet like? Oh, I don't eat much. Well, tell them what you did when you first went to Hollywood. Yes, well, of course, then I was young, and I had never seen such marvelous ice creams, and all the ice cream sundaes. I ate a lot of that. But when I went to Italy, and I saw the plates of spaghetti, I got frightened, but instead of that, if you eat spaghetti, uh, you can't eat anything else afterwards because it's so filling. And uh, I got thin on spaghetti. <laughs> Didn't eat anything more. <laughs> First, I would like to thank you for the many hours of pleasure you've given so many. And then I'd like to ask you if you have one particular favorite film. Well, that's a question that I'm very often asked. And I have a standard answer because, you see, I liked my movies. I liked all of them, even the ones that didn't do so well. I personally wouldn't have done them if I hadn't believed in them. But um, I always say Joan of Arc for the simple reason that I wanted to play Joan of Arc when I was a child. And all through my youth and all through the years, I wished and wished to be able to portray Joan of Arc. So when finally I got it, it's like, you know, saving up for a bicycle. When I finally got the bicycle, that meant so much more to me. So Joan of Arc took a very special place in my heart. Who has been your favorite actor or actress to work with? Now, I can't answer that question because the people that I don't mention will be hurt. Um, I, uh, I don't answer the question of favorite leading ladies or leading men or th the directors. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> if we could, well, you all, the list, though, of just to name the men, Bogart, Cary yes. Grant, Spencer Tracy. How can you choose? I mean, how can you? You mentioned that uh, when you came back to America, you were afraid of the audience. Are American audiences that terrifying to you compared to uh, other countries? No, that was in, after the so-called scandal. It wasn't the audience. It was the people. It was the papers. Because, you see, it was really not in Italy. People in Italy, they another baby. They were just delighted. And uh, then I had twins, and they were twice the... <laughs> delighted and France it uh, I mean it wasn't so shocking it's the American with the American attitude and um, that we're so much against this happening and also because Sweden was against me and um, those two countries were the worst how is your daughter I'm sorry which one <laughs> how is your relationship with your daughter Pia today with Pia it's very good thank you well she came back to me when she was 18 and we have talked through the years and uh, I, we try to understand each other, and I think we're doing very well. What was it like working with Humphrey Bogart? <laughs> <laughs> One of those questions again. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about Humphrey Bogart. But you see, I never really knew him. He was a magnificent actor, no question about it. But we had such t difficulties when we shot Casablanca. We had no script, 
and, and everything was done day after day. We got the dialogue in the evening to try to learn it for the morning, and then they didn't even know how to finish the picture. We were going to shoot two ends. One, I would stay with my husband and pa fly away. The Paul Henry, that was. Paul Henry, yes. yes. And the other one was that I should stay on the ground in Casablanca and stay on with Humphrey Bogart. So I said, well, how can I do that? I must know the end of the picture to know how to play a love scene. Which one of these two men do I really love? And they said, we don't know yet. You <laughs> <laughs> play it in between. So I never really got to know Humphrey Bogart. We mentioned your diet. I also noticed your skin when you walked by here. So beautiful. Have you ever done anything special to take care of it? No, I was born with very good skin and uh, was quite a surprise in Hollywood where they used a lot of makeup. And um, I was lucky then not to use any makeup at all. I, it was just pure luck. Maybe Scandinavian with all our cold weather. But it's cold here too. I don't know why. I, it's not so good anymore. I have a little makeup on now. <laughs> Were there production difficulties in making the In of the Sixth Happiness? Difficulties? Well, no. Here is my co-author, and I want to present him. I hope the camera is on him. And a Alan, would you kindly stand? Alan Burgess, co-author. Uh, <laughs> now, I want you to uh, meet Alan because that's when we met, the Inn of the Six Happiness, uh, because Alan had written the book called The Small Woman, but then, of course, when the part was given to me, they had to change the title. <laughs> and it became The Inn of the Six Happiness, and it was actually Alan who, from the first time, said, um, could I write a book about you? And I said, never, never, over my dead body, and it has to be awfully dead, because I didn't want to have anything said. And then four years later, we met uh, for a charity meeting to collect money for Gladys Aylward. You remember that was her name, the little missionary I played. And um, so we met again. We had, we lectured and we made speeches about the movie. Uh, it was a difficult movie to make. That was really what you wanted to know, wasn't it? We were up in the mountains in um, Wales. We intended to go to Formosa, but that was too much of a complication. But um, every four years, Alan used to call me and say, have you changed your mind regarding the book? And I said, no, I haven't changed my mind. I don't want to do the book. Then, you see, I had that conversation with my son when he said, I wish you'd write it. And Alan called up, and I said, has four years gone by? Have, and he said, oh, I've given up the book. I've waited 20 years. I've given it up. <laughs> and I said, now you can do it. <laughs> and he and we'll did. be back in just a moment. <laughs> We'll return to Donahue. Ronnie, back up just a little bit. When you go in like that, we're missing uh, who she's with there. That's, this is Dr. Jekyll. Oh, Spencer Tracy. Spencer Tracy. Yes. Now, how can I tell who is my favorite actor? Yes. <laughs> when you see people like Spencer Tracy. <laughs> uh, another love story, might we say. Not with you. No, what, what are you talking about? Well, uh, Tracy and Hepburn. Oh, I see. Became well. part of... Uh, you know, entertainment uh, <laughs> history. Is the caller there? Hi, Miss Bergman on the phone. Go ahead. No. Yes. Yes, go right ahead. I was wondering if uh, Ingrid Bergman has any anxiety over loneliness, and how does she handle that? Well, do you have? Do you ever feel lonely, and how do you handle it if you do? Oh, isn't that a sweet question? <laughs> I think we all of us sometimes feel lonely, but now I happen to have a very active nature. I, I just can't wake up in the morning and say, you know, what am I going to do today? I'll have lunch with so-and-so, play bridge in the afternoon, maybe go to a movie tonight. I plan it in advance. I travel. Mm -hmm. I um, see th certain things. I do certain things. I mean, this book has taken three years out of my life, and we really worked very hard on it. And by the time, you know, you get up in the morning and you have something to do, then you are not lonely. But um, you have to have that energy uh, to want to live through the day and want to do something. And there are lots of things that we can do. I would guess that after all of the wonderful romances that you had in real life, many, uh, many of your romances were as wonderful as the, some of the film romances, that, you know, the train station and rushing to the... What a wonderful... I would, be, I would want another one. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I, would, I, would, I think I would be bored without one. That's not so. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I wouldn't mind another one. I'd come to think of it. <laughs> I'm, uh, thanks for calling. Is the caller there? Yes, I am. Yes, ma'am. You had a question. I just wanted to say something more than question. I'm homesick. I have just had surgery from cancer. I had no idea about Miss Bergman. She has been an inspiration. Oh, I, I, it was like fake me watching this program today. You've given me strength oh, and faith. Thank you. I'm 29 years old. I have one daughter. And believe me, instead of, you know, saying, why me, why me, just thank you. And like I said, it had to be you staying home and watching this TV program. And you, I yeah. admire you. You are one of the most gracious ladies. And thank you very much. Uh, before you leave us, uh, uh, you must have gone through some bitterness. I mean, don't you first say, why me? You must have yes, know how she... Yes, of course I did. Yes. No, I, I, I say that in the book. You know, the same thing about having twins. That happens to other people. It can't happen to me. <laughs> and the same thing you, you read in those days so much mm -hmm. about breast cancer. I suppose uh, we, didn't, we weren't aware of it. We, we didn't know what, what it was. And then suddenly all this came up that women should try to find out for themselves and they should be careful. And um, it, it um, well, now I've got confused. I don't know where I am. Well, I, I, yes. we, we will just accept your call and, be v and feel very good. I feel good yes, myself. Well, no, please give her my, can she still hear me? Yes, ma'am, she can. Go right ahead. Yes, please, please keep up your good humor. And remember, you can get over it and with courage. And you have many people around you, I'm sure, that will help you. Don't be sad be happy it could be worse i feel ashamed now <laughs> because i was crying and you know feeling sorry for myself but yeah. um, you you have a family yes i have one daughter i have just recently been divorced and um like i said i kept i was feeling sorry for myself and um this watching this program today it's it's been it means a lot to me sure. it's given me strength and more of an insight on um, I'm not alone. <laughs> right. Oh, how wonderful. I'm so glad you called. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You'll stand. First of all, I'd like to tell you how much I enjoy your movies. I see them all the time. But would you tell us the ages of your children? And if you the have grand the ages yes. of your children, are they married? Yes. And if you have grandchildren? Yes. All right. I'll, I have four children. Now, my oldest daughter won't like that I tell her age. <laughs> She's over 40. <laughs> and my son, um, the big scandal, my adorable Robertino is 30 today. Not today, but I mean now. And my twins are 28. And all my girls are married. My son is not married yet. And I have one daughter living in Rome who has a little boy, Tommaso. And um, uh, Pia, my oldest daughter, lives in New York with two sons. And uh, I have uh, my daughter Isabella, who married a year ago, Martin Scorsese. And she lives between Rome and New York. I mean, she works sometimes in, in New York and sometimes in Rome. And my son lives in Monte Carlo. And we'll be back in just a moment. Adolescence can be the most... Is it? No, it's George oh. Sanders. Oh, all right. I can't see anymore. Uh, yes, well, Mr. Sanders, wherever he may be, will be flattered by my... Yes. I wondered where you live now. I, I live now in London. I have, uh, you know, what they say, a place where I can hang my hat because I travel so much, having my children so spread out. And uh, I'm very fond of my old friends. I travel to see them. My friends, when I was young, were 10 or 15 years older than I was, and now they are still 10 or 15 years older, <laughs> which makes them not capable of traveling so much. So I like to go to them, and I keep up friendship that way, because I think friendship is the most important thing in the world. <laughs> uh, earlier, we were talking about your height. Yes. Did, did it ever happen that your leading men were shorter than you were? And if so, what did they do in that situation? <laughs> yes, well, I can tell now because uh, it's in the book. <laughs> oh. 
No, they had to stand on boxes. You see, you, you can shoot a person coming in here and you don't realize how tall he is until I came up beside him and uh, then it showed a difference. I mean, it wasn't that much, but a couple of inches. Uh, Charles Boyer was a very small man. Claude Rains was small. Um, Humphrey Bogart wasn't so tall either. And uh, Ewell Brenner was not as tall as I am. And being used to putting my leading men on boxes, and they didn't object. <laughs> they liked to be taller than me. And uh, so I said to Ewell Brenner, it seems to me you're shorter than I am, and I think we better get a box for you. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> well, he gave me the best answer I've ever had. He said, uh, oh, no, I'm not going to play this part in the box. I'm going to show the world what a big horse you are. <laughs> <laughs> you said your son Robin encouraged you to write the book. I'm wondering what kind of an impact it had on your other children. Were they compassionate and understanding, embarrassed? Yes, I was worried about my Italian children as their father is dead and uh, he cannot in any way defend himself from what I have written about him. So therefore all my three Italian children read the book before it was ever printed and I asked them if it was anything that they wanted me to take out and they didn't. They said, he was like that. He was an impossible man, but we loved him and that's why we loved him. <laughs> in, uh, in your uh, adult conversations with your children, obviously your children have turned out and they love you very much. And in this age when parents are wondering who they are and, and all of us feel certain guilt about what we did or didn't do, I assume you are capable of freely expressing your own, I mean, do you, did you ever inquire of them about their feelings about your absence and did oh, they? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course I do. I mean, we all have, I would be a monster if I didn't feel that I did the wrong thing and I should maybe have done that and why did I say that and why? Now, do they say, know, oh, mom, say, don't be so hard on yourself? How do no. they handle your that cathartic? I, well, yeah. now they're all grown up and, um, we've ha we had difficulties, of course, when I left, when I had to go away. You know, it's terrible with the theatre because there's one month of rehearsal and six months playing. Uh, in England, for instance, uh, that's the contracts and you can't get a sh shorter contract. Movies you can do easier, but I mean, it was hard on them. But as they grew up, they got used to the idea that I left, but I came back. And they knew that if anything happened to them, they could pick up the phone and dial and I would fly over the whole world to get to them the following day. And um, my daughter Isabella said a nice thing to me not so long ago when she had read the book. And she said, yes, of course, we were sad in the beginning, but then we got used to it. And then we sat down and said, but isn't it wonderful? Our mother goes out to the world and entertains other people. And she makes those people happy. We should be very proud of her. And that's why it was easier on mother. <laughs> uh, just one more question about men. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> Peter uh, Lindstrom has, has, is quoted, or the suggestion is, that he is not altogether pleased with his portrayal in the book. Have you heard that? Well, I'll tell you, when you write a book, I notice it now because I've given the book to my friends, and other people have bought it, they've read it, and, and uh, everybody says, but that's not me, and did I, did, I, did I say that, you know? And they're all kind of disappointed that they don't come out in a different way and so on. And um, of course the people that are not mentioned in the book at all, they are even more angry with you. <laughs> so you, know, you can't please all the people all the time. I just, of course all of us are tempted to conclude that maybe, you know, the flame, the embers still burn with Peter. I mean, you, you do, you had a wonderful relationship with Roberto after the, uh, after the divorce. Your relationship with Schmidt remains amicable and so on. I assume you would like to be friends with Peter, is that right? Yes, I would. And apparently he's not making that possible, is that right? I don't want to answer your question. And we'll be back in just a moment. If you would like a written transcript of today's program, send $2.50 in check or money order to Donahue Transcripts, Box 2111, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45201. Include the subject or the name of the guest with your request. That's Pia and Mama. That, that would be 1940-something. Uh, well, 
Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Don't ask me. <laughs> Please. Uh, so long ago. I've this book is titled uh, Ingrid Bergman, My Story. Uh, we've met uh, Alan Burgess, who uh, leaves her first person narrative to offer uh, some very important information uh, from the outside, so to speak. It's a, it's a very absorbing book, and I know it will do wor very well, as you have done. Yeah. Thank you very much for visiting us. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Have a nice day, everybody. On our next show, we'll be talking about growing up free, raising your children as people instead of little boys and little girls. Letty Cotton Fogerman tells us how. Join us. Services provided and promotional fees paid by the following. The 1980 Ford Mustang. Enjoy the excitement of sports car performance and handling. Mustang, America's most popular sports car. True Value Hardware Stores, where quality, selection, and service are why they're number one. True Value is more than just a name, it's their way of doing business. Your magic begins with love. New Love's Disposable Diaper.